So while I expect you recognize those actors, I don't necessarily think uh, many of you will know which movie that comes from. It wasn't a, a big one. Uh, it's called The Edge in 1997 is when it came out. Uh, and I bring it up because of an exchange, a conversation, a text uh, in the script that I thought was a good introduction for our conversation about hope this morning, uh, hope and shame. The story is about three men whose plane crash in the Alaskan wilderness, and they have to try to find their way back to civilization, of course, not knowing how far or in what direction to go. Uh, Anthony Hopkins plays Charles Morse. Uh, Alec Baldwin is playing Robert. Uh, in the script, Charles says to the other two, you know, I once read an interesting book which said that most people lost in the wilds, they, they die of shame. And the other actor says, what? And he says, yeah, you see, they die of shame. What did I do wrong? How could I have gotten myself into this? And so they sit there and they die because they didn't do the one thing that would save their lives. Alec Baldwin's character, Robert, answers, and what is that, Charles? He says, thinking. So rather than getting caught up in the emotion of how bad the situation is or whose fault it is, the thing you're supposed to do is sit down and think about what you should do. And, of course, uh, the two stars survive. The third guy, whose name, if I told you, you wouldn't know, he doesn't make it because that's the way it is in a big-budget movie. Uh, if you're on the poster, your odds of surviving are much better. But that brings up the question, where does hope on the one hand and shame on the other come from? How can we hold on to hope in the midst of trials and tribulations and not let it dissolve into things like anger or despair or shame? Let's take a look at our text this morning and find the answer. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, Paul says this, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. The not only so connects us back to last week's proclamation from Paul that we have peace with God thanks to our faith in Jesus. And we thus stand at a state of grace where we can boast in the glory of God to come. That was pretty straightforward and easy. It doesn't ask much of us to cheer on the fact that God will finally be victorious over evil. We want that too. We're happy for that. That's easy. Here, however, Paul's going beyond that easy statement to something much more difficult. Finding glory in our sufferings. Suffering's a topic with a lot of misunderstandings. The entire book of Job revolves around the question of why Job is suffering, with his friends offering unhelpful wrong answers, and God ultimately telling Job, hey Job, you are not wise enough. You do not know enough for me to explain this to you sufficiently. One thing that suffering isn't is the fatalism of Eastern religions and philosophies. The Bible does not agree about suffering with the notions of karma or dharma or tau, to use some of the names for it in the East. We are not called to treat evil as inevitable. We are not called to treat evil as necessary nor to minimize it or rationalize somehow that it isn't real. That's one of the paths of Buddhism, is to realize that none of it's real. Now, our calling is not to be the leaf carried in the stream's current wherever it takes us, but instead to be the tree planted firmly that stands even when the storm is howling. We are called by God to join his redemptive plan by combating evil, by opposing it so that it may be overcome. Overcome not with more evil, that would be folly, but with good. 
Thus Paul's call to glory in our suffering is neither a perverse masochism that enjoys pain, nor a resigned fatalism that shrugs its shoulders to it. Instead, it's something else. It's our call both to fight against suffering righteously with love and kindness and our focus this morning to recognize that it provides an opportunity for each of us to change for the better. Of course, the question is, how on earth is that going to work? How is suffering supposed to make me better? Paul's going to tell you. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. As I said, we do not enjoy suffering. We don't try to cause it to ourselves or others. And we should not foolishly claim that God has any part in some sort of scheme revolving around a let us do evil that good may result philosophy, because he most certainly does not. Nonetheless, suffering in this present world is inevitable to various degrees because of two things, the historic consequences of humanity's sin and rebellion in general, and the specific ongoing choices to embrace evil by, and I tried to think of a good number that would fit for this, and I think it probably in this world today is hundreds of millions of people in our world committing evil each and every day. Tens of millions didn't sound like enough, and billions sounded a little pessimistic, but it's somewhere in there. The number of people choosing to do evil each and every day, of course we're going to have suffering in this world with that happening. Now the former, that is our fallen state, and the fallen state of this creation explains why there are bodily infirmities. The ones we pray so often about, disease and age and decay, as well as the natural disasters that we pray about when they happen. The myriad forms that they take of hurricanes and droughts and floods and fire. The latter, human choice, explains why there is a daily flow of news highlighting the evil that people do to each other in the service of greed and lust and hate, and who knows what else. Did you see the news from the soccer match in Indonesia yesterday? People in the stands for the rival teams beating on each other so much that the police were called in with tear gas, and that caused a stampede, and they think about 200 people were killed. Because of a soccer match, and the other people root for the other team, you think you can use violence against them. Yeah, there's going to be suffering in our world when that happens. So do we seek to prevent as much of it as we can, to mitigate and remediate what does happen as much as possible? Absolutely, that's what we do. Such efforts are the calling of the people of God. That is God's work to be preventing and mitigating and remediating evil in our world. But some of it will still happen. And even if we do manage to mitigate it or remediate it, there is still pain and trauma that is real from when it did happen. What then do we do with that? One answer, among several, is to learn what it means to persevere by faith. When we manage with the help of each other and prayer, this is not us on our own, when we manage together to stand through adversity, when we do so while maintaining our faith and living righteously, despite all of those temptations that suffering produces, that are telling us, give up and despair, as Job's wife told him, or give in and resort to doing something immoral in response, as so many voices try to tell us. 
when we persevere in such circumstances, we will indeed be changed for the better. Because perseverance produces character. It used to be common in political discourse to hear the phrase, character matters. Do you remember when people used to say that a lot in political debates in this country? Character matters. Sadly, such sentiment has become much more rare, replaced by winning is all that matters. But that is not the case with God. To God, the development of character is an ongoing priority of great worth, especially in his people. The kingdom of God will only advance when the people of God live righteously in this life. And to do so, they need to be a people of character, a people who choose right over wrong consistently, even when it costs them dearly to do so. So yeah, the people of God are going to need character to persevere while suffering hardship Pain or loss is to build character. To recognize that being a child of God means living according to the fruit of the Spirit in both good times and bad. Like that vow many of us made when we were married, for better or for worse, we need character in both. Character developed by persevering through hardship will improve our ability to be useful to the kingdom of God in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Do we want to suffer? <laughs> no. Does God cause suffering in the hopes that, you know, it'll make us better and that'll all work out? No. But God can turn lemons into lemonade. God can build character and use that to do much good. And then that character leads to hope. The connection between perseverance and character, it's straightforward, right? It fits with our cultural expectations and attitudes. Hard work, paying off, overcoming obstacles through determination, all that jazz. We hear that all the time. In this context, of course, the hard work is predicated on faith and submission to the will of God and, of course, the mutual prayer support and words and deeds of our fellow Christians. But we can see easily enough how perseverance leads to character. How does character lead to hope? Each person who lives an upright and moral life in the face of suffering has done so by faith and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That person has experienced the power of God at work in their own life. That person has been the recipient of the love and mercy of God. How can I be so sure that someone who perseveres in being a righteous person in the face of suffering has done so by the power of God? It's pretty easy. We're not capable of that on our own. We're not capable of living righteous lives in the midst of suffering on our own. It's not our natural human condition. Naturally, apart from God, we're going to give up, we're going to give in, we're going to fall. So when we stand, when we have victory over trials and tribulations, a victory that is judged by how Christ-like we live during them, not by whether or not we somehow win, at that point we will have walked with God in the deep, dark valley that David writes about in the 23rd Psalm, and our knowledge that God was with us even there, our knowledge that we can maintain our faith and morals with the help of God even there. Thus, our hope for the future is firmly planted in God's faithfulness in the present. 
Paul says, hope does not put us to shame. There's never been a person who put their hope and trust in God and lived accordingly, whom God did not respond to with faithfulness. Generation after generation, those called by God out of the darkness to live in the light of Christ have found God to be worthy of their trust. Human enterprises, our institutions and organizations, even our kingdoms and governments and nations will all one day fail. They may be on top of the world now, but one day they're going to be the next Western Union or Kodak. They're going to be the next Whig or Tory party. Or with apologies to Vladimir Putin, they're going to be the next USSR. Relegated to the past. Time and human folly will cause those who put their trust in human answers to at some point be disappointed even ruined, but not so with God. His church universal and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even if your life contains persecution, hardship, loss, toil, even if you end up saying, I know how Job felt, you will not be without hope. Because our faith is not predicated on health or wealth or happiness in this life. On that score, the prosperity gospel hucksters are dead wrong. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. In the end, as followers of Jesus Christ, whose true citizenship is in heaven, our confidence in the future, our hope, is strengthened each day as we continue to receive the love of God. Not only externally in the blessings and of life and sustenance that prolong our days, but crucially for us, also internally where the very Spirit of God dwells within our hearts and minds. Now, I don't know what my heart and mind would be like without the Spirit. Honestly, I don't have any real childhood memories that predate my acceptance of Christ. It's actually one of my first concrete memories of my childhood when I was, I don't know, four or five, somewhere in there. I remember that conversation. Now, my mother claims that at two, or even earlier, I used to pull out the kitchen drawers, climb up onto the counter, and then run and jump off. I can't really dispute that, because I don't remember it. And she does have this one Polaroid of me standing on the second drawer pulling out the third. So I think she wanted proof of that uh, because people uh, didn't believe her why I was so bruised. That being said, others who lived much of their lives before coming to Christ, people who wandered long in sin and rebellion, report how wondrous their transformation was, how bright and warm the light was when they finally came into it. This, then, is the wisdom of the Word of God to us. Are you suffering now, or did you suffer in the past? If yes, did you persevere, or are you now persevering? If you can say yes to that, that is a path God can use to build your character. And that is a quality when we recognize that it comes from God, our Creator, that gives us hope. Hope that understands that God's involvement in our lives is an outpouring of His love. And if we are loved by God, how can we fail no matter what happens next? For nothing is more powerful than the love of God. Four things I want you to remember to, uh, about this passage. Number one, suffering is real. Anybody that says something else is trying to sell you something. Suffering is real. 
and the people of God are not exempt. We know that. Secondly, while God doesn't cause it, he can overcome it by transforming us if we, by faith, persevere. Thirdly, when we do persevere, our knowledge that we did so by the grace of God will give us hope. Lastly, our hope in God is well placed, for even now God pours into our hearts his love. Oops, I gotta turn this one off. So at this point, we prepare our hearts and